Good morning. Hope you had a great weekend. Thank you for being here. Today is the day of the solar eclipse, but of course, Oregon doesn't get any, so. <laughs> wine, wine, wine. Anyway, I'm glad you're here with me and stuff, so. Uh, Cool. Uh, today, 1 10 p.m. lab, uh, several things uh, do and happening. You'll turn in the equilibrium constant lab that we started, that we did last Monday. You'll also turn in another lab. This is a full lab, although it's really easy. It's called Introduce Yourself in Class Lab. It's basically one page lab to make up for Memorial Day weekend where we won't have a lab. It is a full lab though, so if you don't have it, it'll be late, blah, blah, blah. Um, prompt set number one is up. Bring prompt set number one in. I will ask you to put a problem on the chalkboard. Whatever you have, put it on the chalkboard, all right? If it's not complete, it's okay, but put something on the chalkboard. Once we do that, we'll talk about it. I want you to ask questions. You'll self-correct your work before turning it in. Quiz number one will follow. Quiz number one is a show your work quiz, like all the quizzes. Um, you can absolutely have a calculator, periodic table, bring a page of notes. You'll staple that to the back um, when you do it. Page of notes should be all handwritten. No computer stuff, jazz like that. And then we'll go next door and do the Le Chatelier's principal in-class lab. Bring a printed copy so you can write stuff down while we're going through them. Should be pretty cool. Also, as a reminder, if you haven't done so already, make sure you get a class presentation topic by this Friday at 9 a.m. It is worth some points, not a lot, a little bit, so just trying to help you out. Any questions? We learned, we learned a lot of cool things last week. We learned about the equilibrium constant K. Equilibrium constant is always products divided by reactants. So for this reaction, where butane is being turned into isobutane slash methylpropane, uh, butane would be the reactant and isobutane would be the product. So your K would be isobutane divided by butane itself. The equilibrium constant number has meaning for chemists. First of all, K is never zero or negative. K will always be a positive number. But if it's greater than one or less than one is important. K is greater than one mean more product, while K is less than one mean more reactant. So because isobutane here is the product, at equilibrium, we would think we'd have more isobutane than we'd have butane. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a graph of the concentration of isobutane versus butane. And if you're at equilibrium, K is like a slope, all right, with a y-intercept of zero. So this line right here is a slope of 2.5, and that represents all the points where the concentrations of isobutane divided by butane are equal to 2.5. Now, another thing we talked about uh, starting on Friday, I think it was, was this Le Chatelier's principle. And this will be something we'll talk about a lot. Le Chatelier's principle is a way to understand shifts to the equilibrium. So for example, we talked about one way to use uh, Q, the reaction quotient, is to see if your reaction is at equilibrium. Q looks the same as K, products over reactants, blah, blah, blah. But Le Chatelier's principle also helps you to figure out what's gonna happen. So this is another possibility here, where we've got an equilibrium between isobutane and butane. And if you take 1.25, divide it by 0.5, products over reactants, you will get a K of 2.5. So this system is at equilibrium. But we are disturbing it, and that doesn't mean like showing bad images that would scare most people or something like that. It means that we're adding a more chemical. And in this case, we're gonna add 1.50 moles per liter more butane. So Le Chatelier's principle is super helpful here. If you add more butane, anytime you add a chemical, the reaction is gonna shift to the other side. So if you add butane, it should shift to make more isobutane. Conversely, if we added more isobutane, it would shift to make more butane. It always adds to the opposite side, moves to the opposite side. Conversely, if you take away a chemical, the reaction will try to make more of what you removed. All right, and that's another thing we talked about a little bit on Friday. But here, right now, we've got an equilibrium, chemicals are happy, and we're adding 1.50 molar additional reactant butane. So the question is, what's the new isobutane and butane concentrations? And we'll see how you can calculate that pretty readily. Butane and isobutane can interconvert to reach a dynamic equilibrium. The graph shows the equilibrium line. 
If we add butene to the system, the equilibrium is disturbed, and the butene reacts to form isobutene until the equilibrium is reestablished. So the lighter blue line here represents the amount of the reactant you're adding, butane. You had uh, uh, 0.5, and then all of a sudden we're adding 1.5, so it goes over here on the axis to 2. But what's going to happen now is it will go back to equilibrium. Equilibrium is like Mother Nature's way of saying everything's got it together. So over here, it doesn't have it together. <laughs> but here on that red line, it does. So this is Le Chatelier's principle. What's happening is the butane concept concentration is going to go down, moving to the left. Conversely, then, the product, the isobutane concentration, is increasing. And that's what I said. If you add, like, a reactant, you're going to make more product. If you add more product, you're going to make more reactant, stuff like that. Now, mathematically, what you can do is calculate this Q thing, this reaction quotient, and just see what's going to happen. So iso divided by the butane, isobutane initially is this 1.25, initially you had 0.5 butane, but all of a sudden now we're adding extra butane. So when you calculate this thing, 0.625 is the value of Q. And if you compare that to the K, 2.5, this is certainly less than 2.5. So if Q is less than K, that means the reaction when it becomes more like K. So to make this number more like 2.5, you can either increase the numerator or decrease the denominator. In math, both of those will make the number bigger. And both of those mean that this reaction is going to make more products. And a shift to the right, which is what you should put right there, a shift to the right is chemist's way of saying more products, less reactants is what we would predict is going to go on. Any questions on that? Sweet. So what you can do then to figure out the actual concentrations is set up then an ice table. Initially, we've got 0 0.50 and this 1.52, so you could add, put just two down, which is fine. And isobutane is 1.25. Now, because Q was less than K, that means more products. So this is going to be the plus X. One of these is going to be negative, and one of them is going to be positive. And because Q was less than K, that means you're going to shift to the right more products. So the product isobutane will go up, and this thing will go down. So at equilibrium, you'll have 1.25 plus x and 2 minus x for the reactant. And you can take both of these equilibrium values and set them equal to the k, 2.50. And this is one equation, one unknown. Now to solve this, you would take 2.50 times 2 minus x, and that would equal 1.25 plus x. And you can isolate the x's, get the numbers on one side. x comes out to be 1.07 moles per liter. Yes, you can use the solve button on your calculator if you want to. Uh, all of these are possibilities in order to figure out what's going on. So if this is the x, we can plug them in up here to figure out then the iso and butane concentrations. So butane will be 2 minus 1.07.93, and isobutane will be 1.25 plus 1.07, 2.32. And we see that certainly iso has gone up, butane has gone down, all right? So the reaction has shifted to the right, like Q predicted, like Le Chatelier's principle predicted. It's all coming together. Any questions? So today, both in theory and in lab, let's have a little review of all this Le Chatelier's principle stuff, all right? Um, first of all, Le Chatelier's principle is really powerful, and we'll use it all throughout Chem 223 to make predictions as to how reactions will go. If you change the temperature, all right, then it's nice to know if it's exothermic or endothermic. And we saw like exothermic means heats a product and endothermic heats a reactant. You can absolutely use Le Chatelier's principle to see what's going to go down. But these changes actually change K, all right? The number of K will change if you change the temperature. But all Le Chatelier's principle still works and stuff like that. 
If you take away reactant or product, or if you add reactant or product, Le Chatelier's principle absolutely works. Now, K doesn't change in these kind of cases. So if you add something, the reaction shifts to the opposite side. So in that last example, we added a reactant it shifted to the product side. You can absolutely add product and have it shift to the reactant side. Conversely, if you take something away, it's gonna move to the side that you take it away from. So on Friday, we talked about that Haber-Frisch reaction, taking away ammonia is gonna make more ammonia. It's gonna start coming together. And if you take away reactant, you'll make more reactant. Catalysts don't change the reaction. All right, it'll make the equilibrium come a lot faster, uh, but they don't actually change the K value and it doesn't do anything else. So if you saw anything about a catalyst, whatever kind, there's lots of different names for them out there. Those don't affect K, nothing's gonna happen with them. Okay. So that's it for chapter 13. Um, at the end of each of these slides, there's gonna be something like this, and I won't go over it in great detail, but I do wanna talk about them. Study guides are in the companion and online. There are bulleted lists of the highlights from these different chapters that are kind of important. And if you have the time and this is interesting to you, you can go through and just say, oh yeah, I remember that, that, that. But maybe you'll see one like, hmm, I don't remember that. So that might be a cool thing to look at, make sure you're up to speed. Concept guides are also in the companion and online. Those are worked problems from the different chapters. So you can see like how to calculate K, how to use ICE tables, how to use Q, Le Chatelier, stuff like that. The answers are provided, so it's kind of a cool thing to go over and make sure you're good. Sometimes there will be other handouts. There's many different types of equilibrium constants. In this chapter, we saw Kc, which is moles per liter concentration equilibrium. We also saw Kp, which is a pressure-based equilibrium. There are other types we'll see in upcoming chapters. This is just like a list of them. Uh, this is, again, in Companion and online. Also following each of these chapters, there's one page of equations, which I think are kind of important, kind of a summary of what's important. And there's also some end of chapter problems with answers. So I'll show them today. Um, this is the important equations for this chapter. And again, I'm hoping that you can kind of look through this and see what's going on. Uh, if there's any constants which are important, I'll throw those in there as well. And then finally, there are some end of chapter problems. So here's five, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more questions, asking you different things about these chapters. And then the, pro the answers are on the next slide. So if they're helpful to you, cool. If they're not, don't worry about it. It's just one more thing that you can look at if you're interested. But finally, Chem 223, we can finally start talking about acids and bases. Now, why I'm so excited, besides the fact that I'm nerdy, is the fact that acids and bases are huge in chemistry, and I've been kind of tiptoeing around them so far. Like in Chem 221, we talked a little bit about strong and weak acids and bases. We mentioned them and stuff, but we haven't really talked about what you can do with them. And the reason for it is that we haven't known about equilibrium. Well, Oh yeah, now that we are talking about equilibrium constants, we can start to see their true power in chemistry. People think about acids and bases a lot when they think about chemistry, and so that's why it's kind of frustrating. It takes us this long. On a practical level, so many things around us are either acidic or basic. Um, in a nutshell, things that we eat and drink more often are acidic, and things that we use for cleaners around the house are more basic, all right? So it's kind of interesting. So <laughs> meats and fruits, definitely, and stuff like that are acidic. A lot of the cleaners and stuff, though, are a little bit basic. And I did mention briefly in Chem 221, if you were with me then, about the pH scale. And that's gonna come back big time. We'll see how you can use the pH scale and different things you can do. 
so get ready. Here we go. Now, this is actually a topic which is we're going to split into two different sections. And this part, which I'm calling Chapter 14, Part 1, is acids and bases more or less by themselves. All right, so what's the pH of an acid by itself or a pH of a base by itself? In Chapter 14, Part 2, we'll see what happens when acids and bases come together. We'll do a little bit of that here, but more of it is in Chapter 14, Part 2. So here we go. In Chem 221, if you took Chem 221 me, or whenever you took it, um, there was a brief intro to acids and bases, but we need to talk about it again because I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. So acids and bases are big powerhouses of energy when it comes to chemistry, and they split them into strong and weak categories, all right? So strong acids will be things like nitric acid. Nitric acid is one of the strongest acids out there. Now nitric acid reacts with water and it makes hydronium, which is what the H3O plus ion is, and the nitrate ion. Now after what we just talked about in the last chapter, notice the single arrow. All right, this is not an equilibrium. This is actually an old, good old fashioned one way arrow, like we talked about in Chem 221, Chem 222. So, some reactions are so powerful, so product favored, that we do use the single arrow. So, this does not have an equilibrium. All of the nitric acid is converted into hydronium and nitrate. When a few drops of water are added to solid calcium hydride, a violent reaction occurs that produces hydrogen gas. These reactions are real powerful. All right, they're not ones where you're like, mm, did something happen or not? No, these things you know right away what's going on. So like this one, you can see the stuff went flying all over the place. Uh, that's strong acid, strong base reaction, big time. With nitric acid, HNO3 encounters a water molecule, it forms an acidic solution by donating a proton, the H plus ion, to the water to form a hydronium ion and a nitrate ion. Hydronium is really what makes an acid an acid. Nitric acid creates hydronium, but the hydronium is really what makes this an acid. And hydronium can be listed in different ways. Sometimes you'll see it as just H+, but what we'll use most of the time in this class is the true hydronium, H3O+. And some people think there are four waters for H+, blah, blah, blah. We're not gonna go there. We're gonna assume that good old hydronium is one hydrogen ion with water making H3O+. And all of the strong acids will do this. Now in Chem 221, I told everybody, and I'm gonna tell you to do this too in Chem 223, there are five strong acids, all right? And those five acids are very common. They're used a lot because you get a heck of a lot of energy out of them. It is a good idea to know slash memorize slash put on your page of notes these five acids, all right? They're strong, they dissociate 100%, they're single arrows, no equilibrium here, and they all make hydronium. So if we put 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid in water, we really have 0.1 molar hydronium, all right? You've also got 0.1 molar chloride, but that's gonna be boring. Now, this is a new term, monoprotic. That means that these acids give one H plus off per molecule. So HNO3 gives one H plus, and HClO4 gives one H plus. There are diprotic, which means two H pluses, and triprotic acids, and sometimes even more. However, those are more rare. These are the five I want you to know. If there are any diprotic or triprotic acids that are strong, I will let you know. All right, I wouldn't tell you that. But these five, I want you to know. Perchloric acid is probably the most rare acid. Um, it's incredibly reactive. If you look at our fume hoods, it says these fume hoods are not appropriate for perchloric acid. Apparently, the perchloric acid gets into the mechanism and messes it up. I don't know. But perchloric acid is really strong, nothing to mess around with. Oh, yes. Coolest license plate uh, ever. Some of my students sent me this and stuff. HCL, oh, if only my car had HCL. All right, getting too excited here. Know those five strong acids. All right, it's gonna be super, super important. No, you don't have to wonder why. I think that would be a cool license plate. Questions? Mm -hmm.
Yep. Monoprotic is when it emits that one hydrogen? Yep, that's right. So it would be like on the product side? On the product side, you would have one hydronium and whatever is left. All right. So let's say it was HBr, you would have H3O plus in bromide. And if it was perchloric acid, you'd have H3O plus and perchlorate right there. Whatever, whatever the acid is, minus H plus would be the other part. Okay. Now, why it's good to know those five strong acids is there are literally thousands upon thousands of weak acids. And those acids dominate our world. Almost everything that we eat and drink is a little bit acidic. And so our bodies are used to consuming things that have a slight acidic, thank you, slight acidic twist to it. And probably the most common of all these acids is acetic acid. If you've had vinegar recently, the active ingredient in vinegar is acetic acid. It gives it kind of the kick to it. Then there's lots of you know spices and stuff like that that go with it, which is different. But anyway, acetic acid is used a lot in the lab as well. Now, acetic acid has been kind of the problem child since Chem 221. The acetate ion was a polyatomic ion, and it, sometimes it was listed CH3CO2 minus, sometimes it was C2H3O2 minus, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of these are common, and you can hopefully see why now. In the Lewis structure, you've got a sp3 tetrahedral carbon right there with hydrogens. There's a carbon-oxygen double bond on this sp2 carbon. This is the acidic hydrogen right there. If you kick that H plus off, you've got a minus then right here, and that minus can resonate back and forth between them. So hopefully you can see why this has been so strange. But anyway, it is a real common acid, and this is good to know. We're going to use this acid so much that I want to introduce an abbreviation. This is used in organic chemistry a lot, too. Acetic acid is often listed HOAC, and AC is some kind of acetate thing. And if you take that H plus off, then you end up with OAC minus, which is the acetate ion. So if I list HOAC, make sure that you know that this is the formula. All right, you can write it different ways, but make sure you know this is this, and acetate is that. Now, weak acids are unlike the strong acids. Strong acids like nitric acid went 100% to hydronium and whatever's less. Weak acids are all under the guise of equilibrium. You're going to usually have more reactants than you have products, so that's why they're weak. So acetic acid does react with water to make acetate nidronium, and this is an equilibrium, so you do have it. But maybe of 10,000 molecules, only one of them will form hydronium. So there's a lot less bang for your buck, if you will. All of the weak acids are like this and stuff, so. Question. Okay. Now, strong bases are kind of the yin to yang, if you will, for acids. And we're going to see the acids and bases when they come together, lots and lots of energy. Bases are hydroxide creating species. And the strong bases, like strong acids, don't stay together, they break up. And so sodium hydroxide in water will create the sodium ion, which isn't that exciting, and hydroxide. And hydroxide is what makes a base a base. Notice the one-sided arrow, strong bases, one directional reactions. There's basically only three mono bases that you need to know, all right? Sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and lithium hydroxide. So fewer than the strong acids. There are several di-basic strong at bases, but they're not as common. So again, I will tell you all of those and stuff. You just need to know these three mono-basic things. Calcium hydroxide is actually a strong di-basic system. So in a di-basic system, you have more than one hydroxide, and because it's strong, you're gonna use a single arrow. So you could write calcium hydroxide aqueous makes calcium two plus plus two hydroxides. That single arrow tells the other chemists uh, that you have a strong base. So five strong mono acids, 
three strong mono bases. Good things to know. Do you buy this associated with water? So this is the solvent. It's a solution. You don't stay together. There's thousands and thousands of weak bases as well. And the most common of these that you hear a lot about is ammonia. Now ammonia is something that's also been running around with us a lot, and ammonia sounds a lot like ammonia. So ammonia and ammonium would be a cool thing to make sure you've got separate. Ammonia acts as a base in solution by accepting a proton from a water molecule. This liberates a hydroxide ion and results in a basic solution. Ammonia makes ammonium, and that's where they're so similar to each other. So ammonium is the positive version, and ammonia is the neutral version. Now notice how ammonia doesn't have a hydroxide. It doesn't even have oxygen. So sometimes the bases can be a little tricky to identify. Bases don't necessarily have a hydroxide in them. The acids all had hydrogen, all right? So you could maybe make a prediction about that. But a lot of the bases don't really look like they're basic, but when they react with water, they're essentially pulling one of the hydrogens from water to make it. But ammonia, like acetic acid, is very weak. So about 10,000 molecules of ammonia, you would have one hydroxide. So a much smaller thing, it wouldn't have the same effect if you put it in chemicals as, uh, say, something like sodium hydroxide. Now, there are several acid-base theories to understand what acids and bases are all about. And most of the time in this class, we're going to use what's called the Bronsted-Lowry theory. It used to be called just Bronsted. I think chemists liked it because it's got that hole with the circle in it. But apparently Lowry had notes and stuff from around the same time, so now it's called Bronsted-Lowry theory. No problem. Uh, Bronsted-Lowry theory is really helpful to identify what an acid is and what a base is. And in a nutshell, acids are species that donate H+, and bases are species that accept H+. So it seems very simple, and it's not too crazy, but just remember that the acids are going to get rid of an H+, and the bases will be things that accept an H+. There's a handout about this, but we'll go through some examples of how to identify a Bronsted acid and a Bronsted base. This is ammonia, and this is water. And I said earlier how ammonia is a base. We can see here how it's classified as a base by the Bronsted theory. Ammonia acts as a base in solution by accepting a proton from a water molecule. This liberates a hydroxide ion and results in a basic solution. So if a base is a hydrogen acceptor, all right, ammonia is going to accept an H plus from water to make ammonia. But it's interesting here because if you have a base accepting an H plus, then something else must be donating an H plus i.e. it's a Bronsted acid. So water here is acting as an acid. It's giving up an H plus to the ammonia. So one thing that's really weird about acid-base theory, and I don't care if you believe in this stuff or not, but in Chinese uh, spirituality, whatever, there's the yin-yang. Right? It's like a circle, kind of half white, half black. There's a little black on the white, a little white on the black. I love that when talking about acid-base theory, and I don't care if you like it or not, don't worry about it, it's not critical, but it shows this interdependence of acids and bases. Because for a base to happen, you have to have an acid, all right? The acid's gonna give up the H+, and the base is gonna accept the H+. But even crazier is that on the other side, the product side, you have the reversed species. So check this out, ammonia, takes an H plus to become ammonium, and water gives up an H plus to become hydroxide. But in a true equilibrium situation, products go back to reactants. 
So if you think about these two as the active species, well then ammonium is giving up an H plus dihydroxide to become ammonia. It's an acid. So ammonia base became ammonium an acid, and ammonium an acid became ammonia a base. And you can do the same thing with water and hydroxide. Water gave up an H plus to become hydroxide. But on the reverse reaction, hydroxide is going to take that H plus. It's a base to make water. So that's why I really like this yin yang thing, because they were initially acid and base, but they flipped and became base and acid. And those two react to go back to acid and base. So anyway, I don't care if you like yin yang, you don't have to, there's no problem ignoring it and thinking it's satanic or whatever. But anyway, it really does work here, all right? It's just wild. It's this back and forth kind of thing. So bases and acids come together. But in the process, the base makes an acid, the acid makes a base, and in equilibrium, you're going to go back the other way. Questions? All right. So in this reaction, ammonia makes when water are combined to make ammonium and hydroxide. Instead of saying yin yang, getting into weird Chinese things and stuff, chemists usually call them what's called a conjugate pair. And a conjugate pair is just two chemicals that are related by an H+. One of the species will need an H+, to become the other one, and the other species is going to lose an H+, to become the original compound. So in this problem, ammonia and ammonium are conjugates. H+, plus, plus or minus one, will give the other. But water and hydroxide are also conjugates. If you take away an H plus from water, you'll make hydroxide. You add an H plus to hydroxide, you'll make water. So all acid-base reactions are two pairs of conjugates, all right? They're going back and forth. Acids and bases become bases and acids, but in equilibrium, bases and acids will become acids and bases again. It's really wild how this goes back and forth. And this is the power of equilibrium when it comes to acids and bases. Now, earlier I said how water is acting like an acid. And if you have water in front of you, you might be tempted to like spit it out because I don't want to drink no water, Dr. Russell. Don't worry. Water is very normal. Water can be an acid on the last one. It can also act as a base. So water, as we're going to see, is kind of all over the place. So we'll talk about that water in a little bit. But for right now, this is an example of an acid, a weak acid. This is the hydrogen carbonate ion, sometimes called bicarbonate, although I don't really like that. Anyway, hydrogen carbonate reacting with water. And hydrogen carbonate makes carbonate. So these are conjugates of each other because the H plus to carbonate makes hydrogen carbonate. And take away the H plus and you make carbonate. So those are conjugates. But another conjugate pair would be water and hydronium because the H plus from hydrogen carbonate ends up on water to make hydronium. And of course, if you took an H plus from hydronium, you would make water. So these show conjugates. So hydrogen carbonate could be our acid, and then carbonate would be the conjugate base of that. And if water is our base, then hydronium would be the conjugate acid of water. Questions? Okay, so which of these is not an acid-base conjugate pair, all right? Now, what is the connection if two species are conjugates? H plus, good, that's right. One species is going to need an H plus to become the other. The other species, you'll have to pull an H plus away to make it. So nitric acid down here and nitrate, if you added an H plus here, it would make nitric acid. And if you took that H plus away, it would make nitrate. So those are conjugates. Same thing, for example, HF and F minus. If you took an H plus away from HF, you'd make fluoride. Fluoride plus, plus HF would make, uh, would make the HF come back. But if you look right up here, this adds an extra oxygen in it. HClO, hypochlorous acid and chloride, those you can't add and subtract an H plus to make one to the other. Like adding an H plus here, you'd make HCl, and that's not HClO. 
If you took this H plus away, you'd make ClO minus the hypochlorite ion, it would be chloride. So A would be the one that's not, those aren't conjugates of each other. It's only an H plus that can go back and forth between those. Questions? All right. Without the addition of any other substances, two water molecules can interact with each other to produce a hydronium ion and a hydroxide ion by transfer of a proton from one water molecule to another. This process is called auto-ionization. In CHEM 222, when we talked about radiation, we talked about how uh, there's some radiation around us all the time. It comes from space down, comes from the middle of the Earth up, so some radiation around us is very normal. And this is kind of an analogous thing. Um, water can be acidic or basic, but the water we drink is something we're used to, so don't spit your water out or anything like that. But why water can be acidic and base is due to something called auto-ionization. And these crazy hydrogen bonds that we talked about in Chem 222, super strong. And so what happens is sometimes they'll pull an H plus off of water, not just a hydrogen bond, but truly a new molecule. So you'll end up with hydronium and hydroxide. But after a while, hydronium and hydroxide, they think, okay, I'll give you the H plus back. So the water molecules are made again. So autoionization is a natural process for water, all right? There's not a lot of compounds that do this, but water is certainly one that does it a lot. And of course, because water is so important, this reaction's been studied extensively. So chemists have studied the reaction where water as a reactant becomes hydroxide and hydronium. So if you think about an equilibrium constant, you would have just hydronium and hydroxide. Why are the waters not included in that equilibrium constant? They cancel each other. Kind of, something even better. What's the phase of water, for example, at 25? Liquid. Liquid, yeah, that's right. It's um, being a liquid and a solid, things aren't included in K. Now they do cancel each other out, Francisco, so that's totally legit, but, but really it's more about their solids and liquids. I have a question, is that why you so does deionize water do the same thing as that? Is that what makes it special or? Good question. So deionized water, which is what we use in lab, uh, it doesn't affect this at all, actually. Uh, Donovan, deionized water is a way to take out the natural ions that come down. So the water comes from Mount Hood for us, for example. And as the water goes over the ground, it's gonna go over sodium ions, potassium ions, chlorides, whatever. Those are the ions that we try to take out when we deionize it, all right? But the natural water auto-ionization we don't affect at all. Good question. Yep. This is a total normal part of water. Yeah. So it's more about taking out the really small amounts of impurities than the autoization. Really cool question. What is the sub W? Say again. What is the sub W? Yeah. Cool. So this is a special equilibrium constant, and it's called the water autoionization constant. 10 to the minus 14. Are we gonna have, at 25 degrees, more hydronium and hydroxide, or are we gonna have more neutral water? Neutral water. K is much less than one, all right? And if K is much less than one, reactant dominates, and that's what this does. So KW, super important K coming up, and it gets its own special symbol, all right? So now we've seen KC, equilibrium constants based on moles per liter, KP, pressure-based equilibrium constants, and now KW, and KW is something we're gonna use a lot. Now, this number right here has been studied quite a bit at room temperature, 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14. And this number, as we're gonna see, is super important. So yeah, so Cody, if you see KW, that's this number right here, and it's equal to hydronium times hydroxide. So, if you have a neutral solution where no acid and base has been added, 
then for every two waters that break up, you're going to have equal hydroxide and hydronium. So two molecules of water would make one molecule of hydroxide and one molecule of hydronium. The hydronium and hydroxide values will be the same if it's truly neutral. How much acid and base do you have? Really good question. Because they're equal, you can think of Kw as hydronium times hydroxide or hydronium squared because hydroxide is the same as hydroxide. You could also do it from the hydroxide's point. So if you really want to know how much acid is inside neutral water, the square root of Kw would be the way to find it out. And it comes out to be 10 to the minus 7th moles per liter. Now in terms of molarity numbers, is that a high concentration or is that a small concentration? Small, that's right. Like today in lab, you're going to use 0.1 moles per liter, maybe 0.001 moles per liter, stuff like that. 10 to the minus 7th is very, very, very small. So the water we drink doesn't have a lot of acid in it. It doesn't have a lot of base in it, i.e. doesn't have a lot of hydronium or hydroxide. So don't go throwing your water out or anything like that. You need it to live. Uh, it's a very small amount, and that's what our bodies are used to. So all water that you drink will have some acid and some base, but really, 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 really small. So let's say that we have a solution that has a hydronium ion concentration of 10 to the minus 8. What is the value of the hydroxide? Now, this is where that Kw is really helpful to us. And Kw always equals hydronium times hydroxide. Now, Kw, we're going to see, is really important for stuff coming up. Kw, 1.00, or just 10 to the minus 14, is that value. And we're going to use it quite a bit. So if your hydronium is uh, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8, you can solve for how much hydroxide is there. You will take E to the minus 14th, 10 to the minus 14th, divide by 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8, comes out to be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 6. So Kw, very, very, very important. All right, uh, I can't uh, emphasize enough, and we'll talk about this more, how important that KW number is. Yeah. Does KW, is, is it only going to be that number? Is it only going to be the um, 10 to the minus 14, or cool. is it going to be different? It will only be that number at 25 degrees Celsius. Degrees. So Donovan, let's say that you go into medical research, and the body's human body is about, I think, 37 degrees Celsius some of these calculations won't be as effective because you'll have a different Kw. K changes with temperature. And so if you do something with the body, you may have to adjust this a little bit and stuff for that. Is it, and then we're only going to use Kw for um, OH and H3O? Hang tight on that okay. question. Hang tight. We're going to do lots of KW. So yeah, but just keep in the back of your mind. Good. good. So Donovan's question is really good. Kw, if this number is only for 25 degrees Celsius. If you do medical research, you start doing research on Titan, which is really cool, you may need a different Kw value. All right, so some of the stuff we talk about will be specific to room temperature. Temperature changes K, all right? So as long as you're close to 25, 10 to the minus 14th will do. But if you're not close to 25, then you may need to tweak some of your things a little bit. So, let's say that we have some water and we place a little bit of Drano. Drano is essentially, especially the good old solid ones, Drano is essentially pure sodium hydroxide. In this case, we're putting 0.0010 moles sodium hydroxide in a liter. What are the calculations, what are the values of hydronium and hydroxide? This is a really cool question. Now, the equilibrium we're going to use is the good old water going to hydronium and hydroxide. But before we do any math with ice tables, blah, 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 let's think about here what's going on, all right? If you've got this equilibrium going on and you start adding a bunch of hydroxide to it, all right, what's going to happen? All right, well, hydroxide is going to make this number go way, way, way up because we're adding a lot of it. 
but this is Kw, equilibrium. So if the hydroxide goes way up and Kw is a constant, will the acid go up or down? Well done. Yeah, they're going to be opposite each other. All right. If your base goes up, the acid's going to go down. If the acid goes up, the base is going to go down. So here you've got neutral water just kind of hanging out, and you blast it with all kinds of hydroxide. Well, that's going to make the reaction shift to the left. And in the process, your hydronium is going to start going down. Just remember, acids and bases are kind of opposite each other. So you add a base, you'll have less acid. Or if you add an acid, you'd have less base. So we predict that the shot ladies, this is going to shift to the left. Your hydronium, which was 10 to the minus seventh, is going to go down quite a bit. All right? So this is, again, where the shot ladies can really help out with these kind of things. Questions on that? OK. So let's set up an ice table. Water is a liquid, don't need that in the calculations. Hydronium will assume is zero. Hydroxide, 0 0.010, all right? Now water is gonna dissociate a little bit to hydronium hydroxide, we'll call it X, but it should be pretty small, all right? So at equilibrium, we will have some X. Remember, equilibrium means you're gonna have non-zero amounts of everything. So even though it's gonna be small, you will have some and you'll have 0 0.010 plus x. So at equilibrium, these are the things will equal to kW. kW, 10 to the minus 14th, all right? Now, <clears throat> this little x is gonna be really, really small. And one thing we talked about uh, last week in the intro lab is that if you have a thousand and you take away one, by six figs, it's still basically a thousand. Well. This is a 10 to the minus three. And before the hydroxide was added, hydroxide was 10 to the minus seventh. And X is gonna be pretty small compared to that. So for all of these reasons, you can ignore this little plus X. Now besides just being lazy chemist, <laughs> all right, there's a reason why this is useful. Because right now, this would be a quadratic formula. And with the solve function on your calculator, you could make mincemeat of this, it's true. However, it's even easier if you can pull this little plus x out. Because when it was 10 to the minus seventh, it wouldn't make any difference, this number is so big. And it should be an even smaller number here in a little bit. So we're gonna pull that plus x out. We're gonna keep from going to a quadratic. And this equation becomes a lot easier because kW, 10 to the minus 14th, was gonna equal x times this. But pulling the x out, then kW equals x times this number. And remember, x is gonna be the hydronium. So if you do that, 10 to the minus 14th, that kW I want you to know, divided by the hydroxide is what the uh, H, is what X is gonna be. And X comes out to be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11th. Now, prop that off. I see Karina going, oh, Russell, you're making too many assumptions here, right? So I wanna have, I wanna be in good graces with how she thinks about me. So let's say that you're nervous about taking this plus X out. First of all, you can always do quadratic, all right? It's totally cool. However, 10 to the minus 11th plus 10 to the minus three, still 10 to the minus three, <laughs> all right? Really, it's okay to do it. But if you ever doubt it, go back, do the quadratic. Don't take my word for it. I am trying to save you time, and I wouldn't do it if it was wonky, I, I promise. But anyway, you can always go back and try it to make sure. Profit back on. Questions? Okay. So we added some base. The base concentration went way up, 10 to the minus three. And as we added the base, the acid, which was 10 to the minus seventh, went way down, went down to 10 to the minus 11th. And this is how acids and bases are gonna roll. So we have, at this point, more hydroxide, more base, than we have acid hydronium. 
And if you have more hydroxide than hydronium, this makes this a basic solution. All right, you have more hydroxide than you have acid. If hydronium was greater than hydroxide, we would have more acid than we have base. Questions? All right. Um, Sorensen, as we talked about in Chem 221, came around and created the pH version. And pH is a lot easier of a way to figure, to talk about if something is acidic or basic. When you're comparing 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 11, that gets awkward. So pH equals minus base 10 log hydronium. And if you have that neutral solution of water, which was 10 to the minus seventh, you can quickly figure out that pH is going to equal 7 for neutral solutions. So if you have a neutral solution, pH should be 7. Plus or minus a little bit sometimes is okay, depends on your thing. But this is what we'll start doing to talk about when things are acidic and basic. We won't compare hydronium to hydroxide. Questions? All right, we'll do more with pH and stuff on Wednesday. I'll see you this afternoon. Have a great day.